the title of our panel discussion today is A Path Forward for Women, Water, Peace, and Security, Elevating Central Asian Voices from the Women in Water Network. My name is Justin Burke. I'm a lecturer here at the uh, SEPA at Columbia. I'm also the publisher of Eurasianet, a daily news website that covers Central Asia and the Caucasus primarily. We're fortunate to have here this evening uh, a panel of five experts, but before that, we'll also have a presentation on the uh, Women in Water Management Network that focuses on Central Asia. Uh, there is a lot of uh, interesting work, and there are a lot of interesting challenges uh, occurring in Central Asia right now. Uh, before we uh, delve into the, the uh, details, I, uh, I'd like to uh, describe the format for uh, tonight's or this evening's uh, event. First, we'll have a presentation about the uh, Women in Water Management Network, and then we will move on uh, and that presentation will be uh, given by Dr. Saule Aspanova, who is a senior environmental affairs advisor heading the environmental cooperation portfolio at the OSCE. Uh, her work is focusing on sustainable water management, water diplomacy, and disaster risk reduction. Um, after that, we'll move on to the expert panel, a moderated discussion. And we'll also leave some time for, um, for some questions from the audience. Um, so to, to introduce this subject, uh, water, I would say, is at the heart of some of the biggest challenges that Central Asia faces today. Just a, a look at the headlines and you see the challenges. Uh, now, I know Azerbaijan is not uh, a Central Asian state, but it's still a Caspian state. And just earlier this month, they had a violent protest over uh, access to uh, clean water in uh, Satli province. In Central Asia itself, of course, there's uh, a lot of uh, serious issues. Uh, one, uh, you know, we've already seen the RL Sea shrink. Uh, the Caspian Sea is now shrinking too. And by the end of this century, a territory the size of Portugal could appear because the uh, the sea's level is supposed to shrink or is projected to shrink about nine meters uh, over the next uh, 75 years or so. Uh, also, uh, in, in other issues, you know, large and small, there are the large issues like the Caspian Sea, but also there's a drinking water crisis. In Tajikistan, for example, about 80% of rural residents do not have access, regular access to clean water. And that is just one of the problems. Of course, glacier melt is another major problem. And snowfall, the snowfall season in Central Asia in the Tian Shan Mountains, recent studies have shown is shrinking. And it could, by the end of the century, today, for example, uh, the snowfall season is about five months long. It could only be three months in uh, by the end of the century, according to some academic projections. So the problems are myriad and people are starting to work on them. The challenges are, are enormous. And so we'll hear about the risks and possibilities during our panel discussion, I, I hope. Um, so with that introduction, I will pass it over to Dr. Ospanova, who can walk us through what's gonna happen at the UN Water Conference. Uh, just a, a quick uh, preview of the conference. The outcome is supposed to be a wa water action agenda. And so hopefully the panelists will be able to talk about that, what they aim to achieve at this conference. But uh, let's start. I'll give the floor to Dr. Espanova right now. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. I have barely just arrived and landed an hour ago. Um, and uh, we are all very excited and look forward to the conference. As you know, this UN Water Conference uh, is the first of its kind after almost 50 years, you know. So this is one of those seminal events that I think whole, you know, global water community was looking forward to for a while now. Uh, last year, as many Many of you may know that there was a, a Dushanbe conference in June uh, that was, you know, the way to New York, actually. And um, I know that my presentation was supposed to be a second one, and uh, our colleague and dear friend Shanani was supposed to set it up. <laughs> so let me maybe paint a few broad strokes. You know, first of all, uh, here today, uh, we will talk more about uh, gender perspectives in water management. And what we've done is we developed this women in water uh, network, uh, women in water diplomacy network. And that is sort of the focus of our event. But uh, I am representing OAC, which is Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. All right, so maybe let me set up a little bit where we come from in this, what is our entry point uh, in this uh, discussion, particularly the organization. I don't know, I mean, I, most of you know it because I see the audience, but maybe some of you don't know as much uh, about this organization, but our organization covers security first, first and foremost. So the large focus of organization is political and security issue, issues. And so the second dimension of the organization, it focuses on economic and environmental activities. This is what I'm representing, the environmental activities of the organization, environmental cooperation. Uh, the mandate on water management dates all the way back to Helsinki Final Act. Um, you uh, might have heard many references to it. And basically, this slide lists some of the commitments in this area. And for instance, for, for us as, a, as an organization, the quintessential issues become security-based. So it's water access, water security, transboundary cooperation, which is cooperation between two or more bodies, right, uh, countries. And so we cover mostly river basins, which are shared by uh, different states. So for instance, some of the examples would include, um, some of the examples would include Nista River Basin, for instance, shared between Ukraine and Moldova or Chutalas between Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Or for instance, uh, back in the 90s, the OEC facilitated agreements on Sava River Basin in the Balkans, you know. So these are the types of, you know, um, agreements that uh, OEC facilitated. Now we've done it mostly with the UNIC, with Water Convention. Um, and uh, much of the, I think here you can see the list of some of the international frameworks that we've specifically facilitated. One of the latest examples, I mentioned Nistu River Basin. We helped set up the Nistu River Commission. Uh, one of the, the strategic action plan, strategic action program for implementation for the next 15 years of the integrated water resource management plan in, in the Nistu River Basin was developed with the support of one of our projects, which was funded by Global Environmental Facility. Now, of course, due to, to the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, this process was disrupted. But we, for instance, have, are doing the environmental assessment of impacts from the war. And a large part of it is also a, a, applicable to water-related impacts. So, for instance, you know, so this is the type of you know, work and interventions and activities that we undertake. Now... When we come to this subject, women, water management, and conflict prevention, we set up this initiative almost, um, let's say it was seven years ago. Uh, and it started out very small. It started out with just a few trainings, you know, for gender mainstreaming and water management, very exploratory in nature. And, you know, also at that time, um, I don't think the basically gender mainstreaming was only taking, you know, um, 
sort of starting, I would say, even though the issues featured over the last two decades as part of the participatory approaches in water management, but I wouldn't say that they got really high attention you know, to, to, uh, to these issues. And then I think over the last decade, it really, really is, a, now we see the almost pinnacle of this efforts and we hope it will continue because so many initiatives, like for instance, ours, you know, developing networks, networks of networks, you know, expanding these horizons. This is really an ongoing process and it's not so simple, right? But what started, for instance, five years ago is, 100,000 initiative, now it's a 2 million initiative, even, even if you think what, what type of resources it takes, right? Because it takes a lot of investment. Now, I would in broad strokes uh, describe what this initiative is about, because you will see then the list, for instance, of UN uh, water conference events where that is featured. And if you look even at the program of the conference and you just pay attention to the number of events that cover gender perspectives in water management, you will notice immediately proliferation of these events, you know, and even from the uh, uh, sort of proportional representation in the, in the program of the conference, I would say it's about a quarter of the events have something to do with participatory inclusive water governance, you know, and, and such perspectives. And I think our initiative reflects quite well, you know, what that um, sort of trend, the trend is set, but also now it's about quality of the initiatives rather than, you know, the quantity. Um, so overall objective, of course, is to, um, contribute to more inclusive and participatory water governance. Now, we, you know that participatory processes, inclusive processes have been built over the last three decades, you know, in the development community. And so I would, um, I don't think I included that slide in this lineup, but uh, for us, one of the main guiding factors, you know, in setting up sort of our water cooperation is, you know, the, first of all, it's technical foundations for effective water management, data-driven cooperation, technical expertise, and um, uh, design of nimble agreements. I mean, I would, I would call them nimble, but it's really resilient res and uh, responsive agreements that can be adaptable. You know, so because some of the current frameworks that govern river basins, for instance, they were designed, you know, and you see that they need to also change with time, they need to address new needs. So, you know, from the get go, sometimes it's good to put more work into original design, so that, you know, they have uh, predictable and yet also adaptable, you know, frameworks, then effective institutions. Uh, we understand under effective institutions, first of all, such factors as stakeholder participation as a quintessential element of it to nurture trust, you know, respect among players. Uh, and it becomes, it's, it's at this point, a basic tenet, you know, of uh, good resource management. Then transparency, transparent management, uh, which uh, clearly defines responsibilities and uh, powers coupled with openness and communication. Implementation capacity. So what agreements and related institutions that have impartial and enforceable mechanisms to settle disputes. And uh, finally, third big ingredient is committed leadership. And this is where political organizations actually do play a role, um, where it's effective decision-making by water authorities, uh, progressive cooperation, where effective water diplomacy creates frameworks that encourage more expansive and growing cooperation. And finally, the political will. And you know, political will, sometimes it's um, hard to pin down concept, right? We, we always refer to, let's generate political will, but it is ultimately a vital and necessary step. You know, it's almost like a leap of faith, uh, sort of that turns, you know, discussions into agreements, you know, and that's what, in a way, existing political will does you know it actually makes something imaginary or or something that is a just a dialogue but then turns it actually into substantive agreements um this is 
this one was uh, where we started, basically. We developed a guidance document uh, of gender mainstreaming and water governance in Central Asia. Now, this uh, we uh, developed three years ago. And at the time, uh, we thought, well, you know, we'll just need to start from somewhere. And we outlined what it would take and how it was sort of reflective of uh, participatory water management, transparent water management, how that could help build capacity on the ground uh, to uh, make sure that, for instance, we can identify uh, women in water uh, sector in Central Asia, build their capacity, and then ensure that maybe they get a chance to participate in decision making. And this is how the idea of developing the network came about. First, we developed a guidance document. Then it was uh, applicability of this guidance document in practice in academic institutions, in professional associations, in river basin associations, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, we thought, well, you know, maybe we can start with something simple, something small, you know, so to have a a representation from five countries and Afghanistan, and then have a bit of a capacity building program. It wasn't even a network at the time. It was actually a capacity building mentoring program for uh, women professionals. And then um, we started, this is just a, a, an example of uh, information sheet that we, we, we made quite a few of them uh, to, to show what does it mean? You know, what, how does it look women in Central Asia in water management? And what we found, very few statistics, <laughs> very few statistics, very few uh, sort of numbers or, so we had to practically do it, you know, by hand and gather this information across the board. And then basically uh, we uh, launched um, the Women in Water Management Network in 21, which started from the mentoring program. And then we moved on to the network and then with our partners. And then again, I have to highlight that we, it wouldn't be possible to do it without Karek. We have actually director of CARAC sitting right here, Zafar. <laughs> um, uh, this is one of our quintessential partners in designing this network. And then CIWI, Stockholm International Water Institute, Elizabeth, Gary, and the team. Um, that's uh, that's how you know it became possible to both build the capacity of the network, but also connect it to other networks. And that's how, if we had already a presentation from Shanani, you would see the whole setup <laughs> and uh, you would see how the, let's say more growing, uh, budding <laughs> network in Central Asia, you know, matured a little bit, looking at the more mature network in the Nile, women in the Nile. And so the network women in the Nile was that example where we thought, well, maybe we can start something in Central Asia, connect with women in the Nile, and then, you know, grow it essentially. And, and I think now after two years of this networking, which started online, by the way, during COVID years, and we have with us uh, you know, actually, these are the activists of the network. Now, <laughs> these are the most active participants, you know, five, six, seven, you know, the core, the core uh, members of the network who remember those times. I'm pretty sure those first meetings when it was during COVID with much uncertainty ahead of us, we didn't know where this was going and whether we're going to continue just doing these meetings online. And then ultimately, with the, with the first meeting that was done in person last year in the, at the Dushanbe conference, we realized that we actually have something real, something that is, you know, uh, we have a group of people who are interested, who are ready, who are embracing it, and who are absorbing it, and who are connecting in their individual capacities and as a network with other people. And um, then in Stockholm, at the Stockholm World Water Week, we had another big meeting now, having Central Asia Network meeting, Women in the Nile Network, and it became a sort of a forum um, for uh, for women in water diplomacy. 
that's how it started. And that's how the global strategy got designed, spearheaded by CIWI, basically, the global strategy for women and water diplomacy, which now will be um, supporting and hopefully pitching um, all across the board, and which is going to be again presented at the uh, UN Water Conference at uh, side events and will be discussed. So we look forward to those discussions. Now, these are the references to the actual meetings in person. And some of these pictures, for instance, up, up on top, this is our Secretary General of uh, OSCE. Uh, she met uh, the network and she was so impressed that actually the idea that um, uh, a more, let's say, networking platform that OEC has for women leaders as peace builders and negotiators, now they wanted to meet with members of our network so that um, you know the capacities in mediation and peace building could be available to our network. And so, I mean, you can see where it's going, right? It's going in every single direction. And now I think, of course, the beneficiaries ultimately are both the members of the network, but also a larger community of water professionals. Uh, because now I think even maybe, you can attest, the members of the network can attest to the types of opportunities that came up for them. So I think this is one of those really worthy endeavors where you can see actual results. And that's what I think, you know, we're quite proud of it and we hope it will continue expanding. Now we have, uh, let's say third phase of the same initiative now you know, uh, after six years of this initiative, now we're entering the third phase of it, which is starting this year and will go on through 25. And uh, we have all these um, different activities planned, you know, both uh, in the um, sort of a capacity building component with a number of um, negotiation and mediation skills building. And that's within the even OEC, CUE, and so on frameworks. But we also introduced a cross-regional component because we have um, also other subregions which are interested actually to join the network or at least to have this exchange, exchanges and um, mutual, let's say, learning. For instance, as you know, uh, I already mentioned, we have actually very active um, portfolio in uh, Ukraine and uh, Moldova, and we would like to have those exchanges, for instance. And then, of course, the more international uh, cross-regional uh, exchange with women in the Nile, maybe with other networks as well. I'm almost done. <laughs> and um, I let me just quickly, yes, there we go. Um, no, I didn't, uh, no. It's, it's, it was, it's in Shanani slides. <laughs> Maybe I want to highlight it. She will talk about it, but there we go. You know, the, the list of some of the events at the UN Water Conference, we're hoping that some of you will join um, and we would encourage you to join because this is where you will see the different angles and different uh, types of issues where both the network, but also the issues connected to the network can be featured and how they are interpreted, let's say, in the context of our water conference. So this is how I would end my little speech and really it would have made of course more sense if you <laughs> heard first Shanani and so I hope now we can connect the dots and maybe you can ask questions afterwards where we can um, respond yeah thank you yes I'd like to now introduce Shanani Baloi uh, who is uh, a program officer with the Stockholm International Water Institute's African Regional Program a focus of her work at CWE is supporting implementation of development projects that seek to make more public and private capital accessible for water-related projects in Africa. So, Shanani. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'd like to apologize for being late. Uh, I landed today and quickly had to rush to the hotel and I keep on wondering if I'm going to drop or because, yeah, it's past midnight where I come from now. So, but I'm impressed so far that I've been keeping up. Um, so, yeah, um, I'll start from the beginning. Um, I think this is one. your first time. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you once again. So I'm just going to do briefly an introduction of the um, Women in Water Diplomacy Network. And I'm here today representing not only CWE, but then I come as a representative for the Women in Water Diplomacy Network in the now and beyond. So we normally share this um, saying this is what you would normally think di diplomacy and negotiations is, uh, is like. Uh, you may think we practice either one of the pictures that are there, um, yeah, whichever one that you may think. But then actually in reality, where we come from, these are the rooms that we find ourselves in. Um, I'm sure you can already pick up that there is poor representation of women. So you will see that one of the others there is uh, from a, uh, in Ethiopia where we attended some meetings and then most recently uh, the COP27. And this is what we want to change, the underrepresentation of women in rooms and uh, places where decisions are made about a, what, a resource that, in my opinion, women are the forefront managers of water, women are the forefront managers of agriculture, but they are not included in decision making. So um, there are costs and then there's also benefits of including women and also leaving out women. And we, I think this is well known, the failure to include women equitably has a direct cost to political decision making in transboundary level. It has uh, it undermines agreements or cooperation. In fact, I think there's um there's a study by uh, or maybe some statistics released by the United Nations Security Council to say that um, agreements or negotiations where women have been involved it tends to be more durable than when they have been left out. So those are just some of the costs that we lose out when we leave out women out of the rooms where we're making decisions. However, on the flip side, when we support women on water experts, there's an opportunity where you elevate uh, distinctive knowledge, perspectives, and experiences. There's more comprehensive understanding of the relevant water issues. And then there's also a broader set of equitable solutions. And um, what, what are the approaches that um, the Stockholm International Water Institute through our Shared Waters Partnership uh, Program, which was launched in 2010 and is the one that is actually, um, I would say the Secretariat of the Women in Water Diplomacy in the now and beyond. What are some of the, um, the, the approaches that we are using we are using um, uh, diplomacy in a way that we try to bring the linkages between the formal official negotiators and the informal uh, negotiators, which you would traditionally or uh, you would not engage with because they are not official negotiators. So here we bring about intermediaries. It could be academia. It could be people in the media. It could be people who women-led businesses or women-led organization. And we try to bring them into the same room with the official negotiators who are mandated by their governments, who under normal circumstances, these people would not meet. So the, the diplomacy that we are speaking of is a track of 1.5 and where we are connecting track one and track two uh, negotiators into one room. And through doing that, we support the development of a shared vision. We support the understanding of technical and water related challenges and mutually beneficial solutions. And we also strengthen the linkages between political and technical tracks. This is what I was just referring to. And we also support sustainable long-term relationships between the parties. It's so amazing in the Women in Water Diplomacy Network in the now. Uh, today, I think it's a combination of over 500 years 
of expertise that these women bring. And you can only do that through a network which can also benefit generations to come. So those are just some of the highlights or the key aspects of the benefits of taking out negotiations from your traditional, typical, closed, exclusive rooms and bringing in intermediaries and other influencers into the negotiation table. And with this engagement, you can foster and freezing new thinking, new perspectives, new knowledge intersections that can inform the official process. And we also broaden the diplomatic space. So we broaden the diplomatic space, as I've mentioned, that the, we have ran uh, workshops and training where we've had actual uh, official uh, diplomats, negotiators, coming in to listen to non-official uh, women who find themselves as having an influence in the water water resource, but they're not part of the negotiations themselves. So we are opening up the scope of what traditional diplomacy is regarded as by bringing in stakeholders that would not originally be involved in those decision-making or in those negotiation processes. And also by CIWI being a, a neutral convener. So we make it a safe space and we also employ other approaches that encourage women and the stakeholders or indigenous uh, uh, marginalized uh, groups to speak up by using other techniques such, such as which you are familiar with, the Chatham House rules, where we make sure that people are free to speak up in that space where they will not be chastised when they go back into their communities. And yeah, basically we maintain alternative channels of communication uh, should formal relations deteriorate. And that is one such one that is that we are supporting. Um, so our mission with the Women in Water Diplomacy Network is to improve gender equality in high level decision making in transboundary basins. I myself am based in South Africa and the basins that I interact with are the Orange Senku River Basin, the Zambezi River Basin, and the Okavango River Basin. And I can tell you um, for a fact that in my sixth year of working at Siwi, the picture that I showed you in the beginning of what basins look like, it's my reality. That's what we live, that's what we live with. There's this experience that I like to share when I'm speaking is um, the, as a program officer working with a program manager who also happened to be female, when we walk into these river basin organizations, most of the time, the first reaction you'll get is the men saying, so where are the men from Stockholm to negotiate with? Can you imagine how that is so demeaning or so it, it puts you off? So they literally think, that you are coming with your seniors, either maybe they're still stuck in the car taking a phone call or something. You don't even have the strength to say, I'm actually the one coming from Stockholm or I'm actually the one coming from Pretoria. I'm actually the one that uh, is coming to negotiate or discuss whatever topic uh, with you. So these are lived experiences of young, as a woman and also as a young professional. So networks such as the Women in Water Diplomacy Network, they are very important for such reasons to not only elevate women, but also a future generation of water uh, profession professionals like myself to remain engaged in the field as a woman who's uh, less than 35 years old. So it's quite critical that Women in Water and Diplomacy Network, and as we try to extend it beyond, it forms as part of, a, a, of an inspiration or linkages between the, the generations of the older water professionals, the younger, but then also creating a better future where we can have more girls, more young, more young people coming into the sector of, um, of, uh, as water professionals. So indeed, our, our mission, as I was saying, is to elevate women's leadership in regional dialogues around shared waters, and of course, with resultant positive implications for regional peace and human security. And um, yeah, just to date back a little bit, we have come a long way, um, and I would just like to show you. So in the pictures above here is in 2017, when we were launching the Women in Water Diplomacy Network in the NAL. As I said, 
This came in 2017 following a water diplomacy symposium that was hosted in 2016 under CWI's uh, Shared Waters Partnership, uh, which is housed at CWI, and that was also formed in, 2000 and, in 2010. Um, actually, it's interesting that some women in these pictures are present in this room, and it gives me pleasure. I'd like to, uh, yeah, in my I'll probably say a shout out to Adanesh. <laughs> so that's one of our women water professionals representing the uh, uh, coming from Ethiopia. And this is uh, some of the stakeholder engagements that we were still continuing to do. And this is the forum where we met in 2018, where these women are mostly representatives of the ministries of water, ministries of environmental affairs, and of course, ministries of foreign affairs, because with the women in water in diplomacy, we find ourselves at the confluence of water, peace, and uh, security. So that's why the ministries of water affairs and the ministries of foreign affairs are the stakeholders that we encourage to be in those discussions, in those rooms, so that we do not only discuss the management of the shared water resource, but then that the resulted effect is also a sustainable peace and human security. And this is also just another forum that we had in 2020, just before we could no longer um, um, travel and be able to do in-person stakeholder engagements. But then we're very resilient because after this, we were still able to adapt and continue with the stakeholder engagements digitally. So yeah, this is the one of the digital uh, water diplomacy network adaptations that we managed to have, of course, with challenges, um, some challenges to do with technological uh, barriers. They further perpetuated the exclusion of women to participate in some of these engagements because of uh, the connections where they come from, which was not adequate. So we are still identifying it as a challenge that as much as we have resolved to say, OK, not everyone could travel, we could meet digitally. That also came with its own complications and barriers which women and people that coming are uh, coming from unfortunate backgrounds could not join in the discussions because of uh, of internet connections or do not or not having the means to have internet access, which we all know it's quite pricey in developing countries. I don't know about here, but you probably understand. Yes, and then in uh, as Sogo already mentioned, so in 2000 and, uh, 2021, there was the launch of our sister network, which is the Women in Water Management Network in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Um, uh, and uh, she already mentioned uh, our gratitude to the partners that have supported this, Sherek, and also the, the OSCE. And we continue to facilitate knowledge exchanges between the two um, networks coming from different uh, geographical backgrounds, different um, uh, professional backgrounds. We continue to share the, the experiences and we facilitate that kind of sh knowledge sharing to the point of how it has actually informed the strategy, which uh, the network in Central Asia and Afghanistan has also significantly contributed to, as I'll get into the pillars uh, immediately. And we were also would like to highlight the fact that we had these women dedicating their time to become a leadership council in the network. So the network is already um, there's I think before the forum, we had over 50 women that had subscribed into the network and we managed to have the following women nominate themselves nominating themselves as part of the council. And the council basically just works more engaged with the process support team from CWI and um, contributing their time, contributing their expertise to the development of the strategy. And also this is a pool of women that you are more than welcome to actually get in touch with, to engage for speaking opportunities. So this is one of the other thing that we do in the network to come up with a pool of expertise that we use for different global platforms and global forums. And these are some of the resources that you can make reference to uh, just to read up more. And then in the end here, this is where we have, um, we have our strategy, which is launched at uh, last year's World Water Week strategy running from 2022 up until 2027. 
And here, uh, briefly, are the overarching um, uh, five strategic pillars of our strategy. And pillar number one, it talks to gender and youth empowerment. I've already spoken on that. And then the peer-to-peer -peer learning, which we do in our network and also with the Central Asia and Afghanistan network and also other women-led initiatives that we are plugged into. And we are also um, working on research cooperation, which is led through partnerships like the UNESCO's um, um, International Center for Water Cooperation, which is hosted by CIWI and other similar initiatives and then also linkages to basins. So pillar number four is actually what has brought us here to New York today, because we are taking regional dialogues and, um, uh, and bringing them up to global processes such as the UN Water Conference, New York Water Week, and um, elevating those, uh, those discussions at that level. And then pillar number five is also what I represent as a process support. Like I said, at CIWI ourselves and the Environmental Law Institute, we comprise of um, the process support team, which is responsible for coordinating the efforts of this network, um, doing evaluations, doing um, partnership development, to try and fundraise and uh, form partnerships for partners that would uh, be interested in supporting the strategy throughout its pillars. And um, yeah, so these are just some of the pictures from when we launched at, uh, the, the, at the, um, launched the strategy at the forum last year where we did it in partnership with uh, many of our partners and also the network from Central Asia and Afghanistan and uh, yeah, the strategy ad ad adaptation and um, adoption and adaptation in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, I think Sogol has already touched on this one. So yeah, the last slide, thank you. She's already touched on, but then you'll get us, you'll find us at uh, the events listed above. Sorry for Shall taking I up my time. Sing me up with Please. my dear colleague Sogol. <laughs> Just, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but that's Thanks. okay because actually it was two of us who started the network in Central Asia. So I'm actually quite pleased because it lets me bring up Sogol actually thank you. here sorry. because we miss her very much and she's with us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, now I would like to invite the five expert panelists to come up. Thank you very much. And also uh, our moderator for the moderated discussion. So now you can see the logic flow. You know, if Shanani's presentation would have preceded mine, everything yeah. would fall just smoothly into place. <laughs> So I'd like to I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. Uh, we have, uh, and I will uh, just introduce uh, them by name. You can find out their biographical information on the website, just for the sake of saving some time here. Uh, we have, first here, we have Aziza Sharofava uh, from Uzbekistan. We also have uh, Cholpon uh, Aita Khunova from uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Yazat Sirlibayeva from Kazakhstan, Merim Sedakmatova from Kyrgyzstan, and finally, Tahida Kulieva from Tajikistan. And our moderator for the moderator discussion will be Valeria Arlova. Valeria, please. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Valeria. I'm a program management at CAREC which is represented right here. Uh, we are Central Asian Environmental uh, Center, and we are independent non-political organization with regional mandate uh, to assist the Central Asian governments and regional and international stakeholder in addressing environmental, water and climate cha challenges in the region. Um, I'm happy to present you today's pa panel. Uh, these are the members of water 
uh, Women in Water Management Network, uh, who are representing Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, they would share their experience of being a woman professionals. Uh, in water sector in Central Asia. Um, but first, let me th uh, say a few things about the region so you better understand the situation. Uh, so there are two main rivers in Sirdaria Basin, Amur Darya and also Sirdaria, with multiple small watersheds within them are shared by five Central Asian countries and also Afghanistan. Uh, increasing demand of water in Central Asia will be shaped by many factors such as uh, population growth, uh, economic growth, uh, changes in the structure of the economy, uh, and also, uh, of course, climate change as well. Um, the supply of water uh, will be significantly influenced by um, climate change. And as we expect, the population of Central Asia region will grow by six, uh, 76 million by 2020, uh, 2045. So with, it, with this information, we can expect that uh, the growth uh, in household uh, will bring um, the use of water more, uh, of course. Mm. Uh, so keeping in mind the fact that even today, many households in the regions are under supplied with water and sanitation uh, at present. At the same time, the household, at the household level in Central Asia, women are mostly uh, often collect collectors, users, and manager managers of water. And also women are farmers of irrigated and rain-fed crops. Um, women have consequently accumulated considerable knowledge about the uh, resources uh, from its quality and methods of storage. Uh, the need of engaging women uh, in water management should be by now, of course, obvious. Um, women participation is also important for the effective governance in, in the sector. For, sus uh, for sustainable water management, all users and stakeholders should be involved in developing water management and irrigation program. However, despite the potentially valuable role of women in Central Asia, uh, the statistics are not there. We don't have this information, unfortunately. To give you some um, understanding, uh, the number of women involved in agriculture management, for example, persists very low. Only 13% um, uh, of farms are headed by women. Um, so I would like to move on to the questions. And my question, my first question is to uh, Aziza. So Aziza, you represent the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources of Uzbekistan. And in Uzbekistan, like in other Central Asian countries, women uh, mostly work in low paying positions as a technical specialist uh, assistant and laboratory assistant as well. Uh, what do you think? Uh, can, what do you think can be done to overcome the barriers that women professionals have on their way of decision making? Um, thank you, Valeria, for this question. Um, yes, I'm working as a chief uh, expert at the Center of State Ecological Expertise at the Ministry of Natural Resources of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Uh, I can see the growing number of women at um, higher positions in the government of Uzbekistan. About 32% uh, of the seats held by women in national parliament. Um, however, it is still rather low in water sector. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, highlight um, that in each country of our region, there are many similarities, um, of course, but also differences and different challenges for women in water sector. And it is very important to analyze the level of women's participation and leadership and carefully identify the real existing barriers and opportunities and uh, what's uh, most important um, to find practical solutions. Uh, so uh, national statistic in general and labor statistic in practical or does not uh, systematically provide um, separate 
identicators by gender, unfortunately. Um, so we cannot develop uh, effective solutions until we have a full understanding of the scale of the problem. Um, answering our question, I think the approach should be two-sided. Um, government should develop and um, implement public policies based on gender equality through um, inclusive social dialogue uh, that takes into account the views and concerns of women, including the water sector. Uh, but uh, from the public and civic organizations should come the efforts to promote um, the participation of women and girls in decisions and uh, policy making on water issues. Um, for example, um, I personally have a support from my organization to be an uh, active member of the our network, participate in the capacity building events, uh, exchange with other basins, and it should be possible for any young woman specialist in water organizations at all levels. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Aziza. Uh, we are really pleased that your ministry supported your participation and you can be here with us today. And I would like to ask my next question. Uh, it will go to Shahida from Tajikistan. Uh, I know that Shahida is very active in promoting gender balance and, uh, at local level. So my question is, uh, how do you think the women in the rural areas can be supported and better heard uh, when decision on water are, far, are, are formulated. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this, uh, this session. And uh, it is a good opportunity to share, to share with our experience. And um, thank you, Valeria, for question. And regarding your question, um, I would like to share with our uh, experience in Tajikistan. Uh, I'm working in Helitas organization and as a project officer on basin management and focal point on gender uh, aspects. And we are, um, we are implementing national water resource management um, project in the Tajik part of Sardaria. And regarding this project, uh, we are um, considering a gender aspect as well because we have uh, based on uh, SDG 5, uh, based on um, third Dublin principles. and. Uh, based on uh, water reform program in Tajikistan, uh, which was uh, started from 2016 until 2025, where included the gender aspect in Article 150 and other government um, programs. And uh, regarding our project, we uh, conducted research among women and uh, men um, farmers in 2018 and last year. Where uh, we asked uh, from women and men, where why you are not participate, why you are not uh, uh, participate in the uh, meetings uh, among uh, water users associations, and uh, not active. Yeah? Then um, we had uh, some results uh, after this research, and uh, farmers uh, they said, especially women, they said uh, we haven't uh, background in water management. We are not, um, um, so we are not, uh, we, they have a low, uh, low self-esteem and uh, lack of uh, skills and knowledge uh, uh, on advocacy, on water management, on leadership and um, without background, yeah, I said. And is the um, main of, um, we and these one factors, it's about mentality, traditions and culture very dominate this uh, our women for active particip participation in the water management. But uh, when we, I talked with uh, farmers, they said, Shweda, I'm not interested to participate in water management. We had this result from women because they are comfortable sit at home and care for children and not participate. Why not interesting? 
for me, wow, how? <laughs> but it's weird. Well, not more women, but we had this category. Second category, it's about um, the women, they want to be uh, active, but oh, okay, mentality, traditions, culture, what say my neighbors or my family, my husband like this. And they say, not, I'm not participate, yeah? Third uh, categories, uh, women, they uh, ages 40, 50 plus uh, women, and they want to be participate. They are so active, and uh, they want to learn more, and they want to be, um, to get a uh, background, education, uh, some skills, some maybe short courses, and we are looking for uh, to organize these short courses for these uh, active women. Yeah, that's why uh, after that we uh, they uh, they said about um, we haven't any uh, platform, we had any like conditions for discussion. This uh, after that we based on our project we organize platform based in women forum of Serbia where we include and invite all stakeholders uh, and uh, uh, from government, from universities, from a local level, from farmers, what is associations, and we sit together in discussion about gender aspects, how we, how we can um, uh, uh, women in water management. And we, uh, this Basin Women Forum, we created in 2019, and uh, this continue our forum, and we conducted two times uh, per year, one day before River Basin Council. We talk, uh, we, we conduct the Basin Women Forum, and all the results we presented in the River Basin Council, at the government level, at the national level, yeah? And we discuss all issues and try to, um, activization of uh, women who want to be part of uh, water management, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, okay, and it's uh, my uh, short uh, experience. And we, if you have any questions after that, or maybe mm -hmm. after our presentation, we can discuss. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Shahida. But I just want to let you know uh, we have limited uh, time left, so keep your uh, answer it's very crisp and tight. But anyway, uh, Shahida, uh, thank you for much for sharing the information. And we also know that Basin Forum and other work will be represented at the Water Conference uh, on March 23rd. Please, uh, dear participants, uh, take a look, participate at the event. They will be very uh, fruitful and informative. And my next question is to Cholpon, and it's dedicated uh, to education. I know there is a huge gap uh, still in the education access uh, for women and also for uh, capacity development uh, due to many reasons. Um, however, Cholpon, do you think it's due to limited number of programs uh, to support young females? um stu young female students or and what can be done about it so we can improve the situation um thank you very much uh, valeria for the question and uh, i'm very happy uh, to be here at columbia and um actually uh, i think to answer this question i would like to reflect a bit on my personal story yes of uh, how i got engaged because um as uh, shahida just mentioned you know i think i was in a way one of those happy persons uh, not caring of um, too much of these things and just like uh, enjoying my life until uh, these first engagements uh, in the water se sector started actually for me and it uh, actually started with the um, the the youth um, in water network we have a central asian uh, youth for water network which we actually call it with my colleague uh, lazat uh, but anyways i mean it um, at that point it started as uh, as the very first steps it was uh, awareness and it was learning oh we had that sea and we had those issues <laughs> like um in the beginning uh you mentioned the rl sea you know so it was really on that level of awareness and uh, getting closer let's say to the second Sector, yeah, uh, but then later uh, being engaged uh, with our beautiful network of women in uh, water in Central Asia, I started actually having a um, deeper um, 
a view on things, yes, and um, as you've learned from uh, the colleagues, it was a lot of capacity building and uh, actually studying the, the, the situation of uh, women in the water sector in the context of Central Asia, yes, and here colleagues mentioned that there are quite a few challenges still because uh, Central Asia, it's uh, the, 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 the post-Soviet space and we are still, let's say, the emerging democracies, yes, would be probably to say it this way. And we also could apply the cultural context because it's still, um, yes, we are talking about participation. Yes, we are talking about inclusion issues and many, many, many other things. But are we still there yet would be another question, yes? So if we put all of those layers of factors together, then you will see that, uh, yes, that combination of factors actually makes it an issue when we answer to the question, like what should be there uh, to make it a better, um, be it awareness, education, uh, be it like more maybe professional engagement with the sector, uh, you know, so um, I would say it's not just um, access to education, yes, uh, because then we have a lot of water education around, but then it's like really the quality, the being up to date. Uh, so those kind of issues are there when we talk about water education in our regional context, but I think uh, maybe it resonates also with other parts of the world. Then we have, as it happened in my case, I would be just living my happy life. <laughs> but if that first awareness raising, uh, that sensitization of me as use, and that type of engagement wouldn't happen, then possibly I would not be here, you know, like following all those uh, local to global processes, dealing with the multiple stakeholders. And we are really talking about the collective leadership. Yes, that it's no more possible for um, like one group, let's say, to deal with such a complex water. Yes, and here, like even when looking at our network and in a way, maybe it's an answer to the second question. Yes, because I mean, what the network means to me, because it is really this collective intelligence. It's this collective richness, yes, of expertise, of the backgrounds, of, of everything. We have here Aziza from the ministry. We have Shahida who deals with the bottom-up, uh, this action which is like going all up all to the scales, you know, like it's it, it's it, it's really the diversity. We have used Merim and so on and so on. And being embedded, embedded as the Central Asian network also within the global network and having this exchange with our sisters in the Nile and beyond. I mean, this is what, <laughs> when we talk about really how to make it uh, not just accessible, but really meaningful of a good quality. Uh, so it's awareness, education, exchanges. It's really about capacity building and really also um, I mean, those are no, not the final stages, right? And I think it's uh, Dr. Ospanova also mentioned, it is a process. So it is like an ongoing thing and uh, we really need to foster those collaboration ecosystems and uh, yeah, I'll lead it this way. Thank you. So Chopin, this is an excellent question and <laughs> answer. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I agree that um, it's very important to cover all the things you mentioned. And um, we also have meeting here and she's also from Kyrgyzstan, but I, I would like to ask her a different aspect of probably the same uh, issue. Um, what do you think are the main barriers uh, that women have in Central Asia that keeps them from staying in water uh, sector careers? Why are they not development and continue working in the in this sector? <laughs> Yes. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so thank you, Valeria, for the question. Yeah, by the way, I'm Maria Sidakmato from Kyrgyzstan and the youngest uh, member of the like uh, Boz uh, networks. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there are like um, many barriers um, for women in the water sector, as uh, like in the world, and uh, as a uh, like uh, barriers of perceptions of women roles in the uh, like society and uh, and everything everywhere and the strict hierarchy and stereotypes um at the work um lower sal salaries as um as Isa mentioned and uh, additionally there 
is uh, like a uh, like barrier that um, like women like um, high expectations for women. Um, yeah, being like young uh, water like specialist and yeah, me myself for instance uh, recently. I uh, was uh, I was with my mom and the uh, bazaar and the, uh, the and uh, we were buying something like uh, shopping th this jacket actually <laughs> and I was looking for like uh, like uh, this jacket and fabrics and etc. Uh, while my my mom was uh, looking for something like gift for like br bright gift for me and <laughs> like I'm not looking for like marriage not yet yeah I'm I'm young water like a specialist and, and and she was like <laughs> and yeah and um, so th those kind of uh things are happening like um not uh, not with me only yeah um at the all all like spheres so the all levels uh almost everyone's um like uh, experiencing this um, this kind of perceptions and uh, expect expectations for women, like um, and almost everyone sees women um, like not as a specialist or expert, uh, but as a woman whose role is uh, to make like uh, to act uh, their roles at home, and yeah. And th these things happen in every steps of a uh, woman's career, like uh, from the like as a young a young expert uh, to the high levels. And uh, the solutions, I think, like for, uh, is from my point of view, is uh, women need like women need women water role models, and then this gives me. Uh, uh, then our network, um, so seeing so many women uh, who works uh, in the water sector is driving me to continue my career. And I think every like woman who's in, in our network or knows our network, uh, like c will continue like believing themselves uh, like, to continue this way, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Miriam. Um... And uh, my next question is uh, for Liza. She's from Kazakhstan. Uh, and I know as a, a youth network coordinator, you promote engagement uh, of youth in water diplomacy. Um, so how do you think we can make it better for women's engagement in building transboundary dialogue based on your experience? Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So. Indeed, for the past, I think, more than four years, uh, I've been co-leading this youth network. Uh, it's a regional platform that basically unites uh, the whole five Central Asian countries in Afghanistan. Um, and our main goal is to empower the use of the region in the water sector, uh, focusing on involving youth in decision making uh, within uh, water sector. I think uh, we have some bright examples which could be shared today and could also be uh, maybe <laughs> inspirational for our women network. Um, so we uh, foster exchanges and dialogues between uh, use of uh, use that share the same waters, transboundary waters. So basically from the same uh, ba uh, river basin. Uh, so far we have organized two dialogues and one of them is actually uh, focusing on River Chutalas, which is a, considered to be a successful case of transboundary water management in the region of Central Asia. I think it's important to stress that in general, uh, over the past few years, um, regional water cooperation has been um, enhancing or developing or strengthening. And I think the region, the, all countries of the region, they understand the importance of cooperation. There has been a study of inaction in water, uh, um, inaction in cooperation. So the cost of in cooperation between the countries of the region um, is estimated to be 4.5 billion USD per year. So it's quite a big number of uh, money to be lost, you know. And the countries are putting a lot of efforts to build this dialogue and cooperation and actually um, building this way forward together. 
Uh, I think another good example is also um, a bilateral dialogue between uh, Tajikistan uh, and Uzbekistan on Zarafshan River, which is basically, you know, um, related to investing in flood protection related to this river. So there are quite a lot of water-driven projects in the region. Um, it has been mainstreamed a lot in, lately. And I think what we lack uh, is involvement of these people uh, who are actually affected by the decisions or outcomes of these projects. And I would like to highlight that women are among these stakeholders who actually need to be involved in the um, development or uh, design of these projects. Um, so <laughs> um, how uh, this could be done on the example of the network? Um, we have uh, got an approval from the government of Tajikistan for use to access the River Basin Council meetings. It has been a long process and I think it's one of the not many uh, you know, uh, examples that you have even worldwide. So we have um, granted this access for young people to attend these meetings and to actually vote in these meetings. Um, I think it's, um, it's also like a political will uh, of the country, the you know institutional um, level of engagement, let's say. So um, it has been quite productive with young people and we see that it's working and we see that um, it's quite important to build the capacities uh, of the youth to be able to actually go and engage in these uh, meetings. So it's not, it doesn't stop there when you get this uh, approval or grant to attend these meetings. It's also a lot about funding because we want to uh, mobilize the use not only from the main capital cities, but also from remote areas. So it's a lot about funding. It's a lot about capacities of the use once they go there, how they represent and what kind of knowledge they could share. So that's um, on behalf of the of this river basin councils, they could see that it's actually um, you know, a fruitful exchange for, for both sides. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, we should start at the local level, building this water diplomacy processes and then moving, uh, moving uh, bottom up, let's say, to a national and then transboundary levels. Um, yes, and I, I hope that uh, with the women network, we also will see um, very fruitful results in the near future. Uh, in the near future, um, I, I think we have a great potential with that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always nice to hear successful stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I can, I'd like to ask uh, one question: um, the you about the UN conference and expectations. The UN is building the water conference as a crucial moment to take concerted action in addressing water-related problems. I'd like to ask the panelists, what are your expectations? What do you, uh, going into the conference, what do you hope to achieve during the conference? And do you think the UN, you know, the, the action agenda will be uh, implementable? So who, who wants to take that? I think we, we don't have any choice like uh, <laughs> uh, we we must do do something like uh, there is a, no option to to not uh, act uh, now so I think we should come to uh, something that uh, will be real like uh, as UN Water Conference says like cross-sectoral um, solutions so I believe that uh, to achieve this goal of the conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think in terms of uh, representation, so we represent both the youth network and women in water diplomacy. So maybe wearing a um, couple of hats, you know, it's always uh, important what we do after. Um, I mean, there are a lot of engagements of both youth and women in different sessions. It's very nice and it's very 
pleasing that uh, you see this inclusivity in all of the sessions, um, but also like how it goes forward. So uh, it's it's a one thing when you uh, say something beautiful at this session, side events, um, but then what are the next commitments and how actually um, we would see uh, if these commitments are being taken further. So how would the monitoring would, would go further? That's one of the main questions I have personally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if I may also add, um, uh, I do believe that this ind it is indeed crucial and historical. Um, and uh, yes, <laughs> there are the, I mean, there is this examples of uh, more inclusion, of more participation. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's quite ambitious. Uh, but uh, yeah, let us be maybe <laughs> less romantic and uh, be like more realistic, let's say, about things. And I personally, as a young person, as a um, what water advocate uh, from Central Asia, I would like to see uh, more of uh, action orientation and real action afterwards. I would like uh, to be transformative, and I very much believe in this um power and this emerging transformative potential of the networks and as Dr. Ospanov also mentioned, networks of the networks, you know, so I really believe that we will be able, we as humans, we as professionals in the water community, uh, we as representatives of different sectors and regions and nations, we will be able to build those connections and really, uh, because I'm also studying professionally this, what is it to be the multi, uh, whatever stakeholder, <laughs> the partnerships, what is it that collaboration? Is it really such a, such a thing as collaboration and how to build high quality collaboration, you know, high quality communication. So I really do expect personally uh, these things to happen afterwards. And I really, in those terms, believe that this is something historical. This is something more inclusive. This is something more, um, participatory, you know, so, um, yeah, and thank you. Um, another question is, uh, in Central Asia, water has been at the heart of some conflict, most notably recently, late last year, uh, between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, ultimately uh, about land, but it all, the fundamental thing is about access to water. Mm -hmm. Is what is another potential hotspot that could pop up in 2023 with a water rooted issue that we should keep our eyes mm -hmm. uh, Any volunteers? If not, I'm going to go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I thank you very much for. Um, asking uh, those questions, I think those are really important and possibly I would also use uh, this platform because since it's uh, a nice uh, open dialogue and exchange, yes, in this academic sector, uh, water is not uh, just a contested issue between our countries, uh, who are, by the way, very close by history and culture, and we actually interact on the personal level as just humans uh, in a wonderful way. What there is an issue even bit within the countries, you know, and uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, like really on my behalf, being a uh, representative of the Kyrgyz Republic, we are. Uh, the so-called democracy of uh, the region, we are having big human rights issues related to water. And it's actually um, because of this uh, transboundary uh, agreement on one of the reservoirs now affecting, let's say, the internal situation. And we have those 22 detainees, let's say, who were just putting up for an open discussion, for an open public discussion, whether uh, this should be the agreement or not, so it was there, you know, so really, um, like, um, I do not know, <laughs> and shall we be really like thinking, um, like tuning ourselves towards, okay, what is the next hotspot, you know, uh, I think we should be moving away from that, be it like <laughs> inside of our countries or between our, our countries, you know, because indeed there are like more of a uniting uh, factors uh, within our countries. So maybe we should be focusing our energy and resources on rather building those dialogues and collaborations. And like, as we really also try to do it, like multi-track, um, uh, the, the water diplomacy, yeah, like in the network. So maybe really just fostering those, um, uh, yeah, 
in our regions, um, in our region and inside of the countries. Yeah. Is there any question in the audience? I, I would ask, I would, to follow up then, what is the uh, area for greatest potential in water cooperation mm -hmm. in the region? Um, well, actually, Shahida wanted to say, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, basically, I do really believe in this, uh, well, you know, the dialogue and cooperation and uh, the power of communication because it's the glue, you know, and actually if we really foster what we call this multi-track uh, diplomacy, which, which is not only about the big leaders uh, deciding the big questions, yes, but it's really like going really down to the... Um, the, the, the sub basins, the multi stakeholders, like really listening to the water users, be it the farmer, be it like initial and indifferent <laughs> to water issues person like me, for example, yes, be it the women who are the bearers of all the issues. So I really believe in those small things and uh, on those different levels, because again, when we talk about this collective. Um, Approaches, yes. I mean, that's that's where the key is. So everybody in their capacity, it was in their, whatever, the boundaries, yes, of their action, they should be promoting it. And uh, actually we are, um, as a region, uh, we are, I mean, there are really more connecting and uniting uh, things there, you know. We just need to remember once again about those and to really help with those to promote the water cooperation issues mm -hmm. yeah uh, i think shahida wanted to say something and we can translate thank you uh, regarding first question your first question i have more expectations because on, on march 23rd we have site event and we will present our, our tragic experience yeah it's a basin level it's a great opportunities i remembered when i i have been in Stockholm in 2017, and I was presented the use of um, uh, water, water, uh, water, uh, and uh, when I said uh, I am from Central Asia, and look at some participant Central Asia, where is it? Where Central Asia? The, uh, if I say Afghanistan, oh, okay, we know about Afghanistan, but uh, about Tajikistan, they don't know, yeah, and. Um, Today we present our uh, country, yeah, Tajikistan, and uh, now we uh, more participants know about Tajikistan also, yeah, and it's great opportunities. We present our voice of women from bottom up, yeah, from local level to uh, global level. It's, uh, it's a basin level, national, regional, and global level. It's good uh, um, uh, opportunities and uh, regarding. Um, uh, yes, I'm believing uh, this conference should be and uh, for change like uh, from uh, plan, uh, go to actions, yeah, and better cooperation in future in water management. Uh, I hope for more uh, actions for transboundary cooperation, yeah, water diplomacy. And regarding your second question, uh, maybe help my colleagues yeah, for translations. Я надеюсь, что вообще никаких конфликтов не будет в будущем. Я очень надеюсь. Да. Сейчас мы сидим. Сейчас мы сидим друг с другом с Кыргызстаном, Таджикистан, и у нас есть понимание, что нету вообще как бы причины для конфликта можно договариваться обо всем. Or is seated, seated, uh, seated here with Cholpan, they're talking, and she doesn't see any real substantive reasons for any conflict. It's more uh, artificially created. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm adding mm -hmm. this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> 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 In the last year, when there was a conflict, the uh, Hajjabakargansky Canal, когда перекрыли воду с кыргызской стороны, и пока наши таджики мужчины искали выход, как сделать и договориться, женщины, фермеры, диканские хозяйства объединились и начали по очереди использовать воду скважины. То есть аккумулировал как бы, конфликт в позитивном русле, что женщины объединились да, и использовали воду. 
it's been a long time for my, my Russian budget. There was a conflict with uh, over water and uh, the Kyrgyz side blocked a canal. Please. Yeah. The, just actually, you know, just let me. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'll get all the... So this is actually it's a great the... example, yeah. you know, uh, when, when, and Shakira highlighted that wild man, when the canal was blocked, you know, and there was a lot of, you know, sort of uh, animosity and fighting in between, but actually it was women from those two communities, you know, from local communities, they unified and they actually shared water in between because the the immediate water users and that's now I'm extrapolating <laughs> that uh that and that's typical in fact in many of those you know local community based conflicts is because women they they need to find a way you know how it works and to ensure that it works because this is a vital resource you can't be without water. Да, и поэтому мы сейчас будем смотреть на трансбондер кооперейшн и вот эту дипломаси at the local level. That's why, yeah. That's why we are looking for cooperation and maybe new projects, yeah, for water cooperation, for transboundary cooperation, and try to uh, education and try to uh, to get skills for local farmers, yeah, for local women and men also, yeah. That's why I started my words. I hope um, in future without any conflicts, yeah, I hope. <laughs> but <it's not>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. I'll give, you, I'll give you the last word. We're yeah. pretty yeah. much out of time. Okay, um, answering to the question of uh, uh, Sola Spanova, um, like mm -hmm. what if there are, yeah, conflict? Uh, I think um, from the like uh, past uh, like conflicts, uh, I was like, uh, um, I I realized that there in the negotiations table there is no man, oh no woman. <laughs> I wish I, I wish there was <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, there there was there was any like uh, from the like, uh, uh, from the uh, two sides there there was no woman and yeah uh, even if the conflicts like uh, happens um, uh, we we should like uh, uh, prepare or some like programs or I don't know uh, like some help. Uh, to engage women on this negotiations table, I think. Um, and as we had like uh, uh, mentoring in the mentoring program, the like tools of negotiation and etc. Even one woman makes the like change in the in the in the like in the room in the negotiations room. So I wish there the there won't be any conflict but if there is uh i wish there will be like more women yeah all right we have time for one more question i'll ask a question um thank you very much enlightening panel thank you to all uh i'll stop here um, I was wondering exactly that, like how do we ensure that women are better integrated within the ministry? I think mm -hmm. in the panel, there is currently just yeah. one person who is working within a ministry. Um, how to make sure that we really um, make the link uh, between what is doing being done here and uh, people who at the end will come to the negotiation yeah. tables. Um, and how do we make sure that people who are at the ministries get their voice uh, lifted up and don't stay really stuck uh, in those technical position? And it, uh, we know it's frustrating. So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. just stop here and uh, thank you again for a very enlightening panel. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Franz. Uh, my question is uh, after creating that network, you observe or you see some achievements, especially in the participation of women in the water diplomacy. 
So uh, in um, my experience, can I have been a member or working as water diplomat in the negotiation in negotiation team members in the water sector in the technical part? Only I'm the woman, but the the, the team is male dominated. Always they want to discuss each other. Even I'm the team member, mm -hmm. but they are not interested even to include or to participatory manner. So I I'm facing the challenge like this. And mm. the challenge like that, and how you resolve that challenge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It looks like one more question, question should be collected, and no, but it's okay. one more. <laughs> All right, one more, and then <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll all leave. Okay, uh, yes, I will try to be very quick. So, uh, thank you again also for uh, this uh, really discussion. And uh, I just came from uh, Israel. Where they also have this kind of water crisis between Israel and Palestine. And the way they decide situation, they use salinization uh, technology. And for now, Israel is one of the leading uh, country in the salinization. Don't you consider it as an option also? And uh, don't you consider it as a good opportunity for women to be involved in uh, uh, women in STEM and women in businesses to participate in the mm -hmm. Yeah. I can take the third question. Okay, if you can go very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, programs to actually empower and support uh, young uh, female in STEM in the region. Well, maybe worldwide as well, but I see a lot of them uh, appearing in the region lately. So I think a lot of support and a lot of focus is being um, driven towards this. Um, I'm not, um, you know, I, I don't have a technical background to answer the question about desalinization, uh, but I'm sure the costs uh, and benefits, uh, you know, of this question, they have to be analyzed by people who have specific background to be answering this question. Um, but what I believe, and maybe it's a bit complementary to, Chol to Cholpon's question, uh, countries are cooperating to actually um, look at not only water solely, but how water energy and food and environment, they come together. It's a cross-sectoral, uh, cross-cutting issue. So I think, um, you know, it, it all has to be calculated and, um, you know, looked at uh, from all the perspectives of how, um, how uh, beneficial this would be for the region in terms of finance, in terms of environmental, political, uh, and other uh, indirect costs. Um, there is possibly an uh, answer to question one from Shuhida, and if colleagues don't mind, I have a question for Akash. Oh, answer. <laughs> Regarding Tajikistan, we have a deputy of men, uh, deputy of minister in um, energy and water, um, water. But uh, when I asked about basin level from women, why you not go up? Yeah, they said not interesting. Some. Uh, second, uh, they said it's from, for me comfortable. Um, for example, um, head of department, it's for me comfortable. Uh, place after my maternity leave I, I can come again and it's okay for me and I said why in the province level or national it's big responsibility for us we have family children and our uh, work and after that uh, when we go to up and we need more time and graphic the second duties Overload, maybe, yeah. yeah, it's not comfortable for us, for our family. Yeah. We need to care with family and to be with family Sunday, Monday, uh, Saturday and Sunday. And it's not um, comfortable for us. Yeah. This is uh, some factors, yeah. Yeah, but if I may just add uh, to that, I think it's uh, the issue of time. So I do believe that it will be uh, an increasing number of um, women, let's say, uh, within the, 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 the state bodies and uh, also potentially in the leadership positions. It's just, yeah, it's the matter of time. It's the matter of uh, this capacity building and uh, possibly reaching this critical mass because we still have those uh, very good examples. Yes, and Dr. Spanova shared earlier when uh, the, the, the Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, they do share this uh, commission uh, 
Transboundary Commission for the two rivers, and it's actually a great example. And actually, building on that, I have uh, the short answer for uh, your question. Yeah, on uh, you know, like how uh, uh, the women's participation at the negotiations uh, table is uh, perceived and how it's affecting actually those negotiations. So um, uh, a study by Jennifer Zering, I believe, uh, was recently uh, published on exactly this uh, issue. So uh, how the presence of women at the negotiations table is um, like affecting the very outcomes. So in Central Asia, actually, uh, where of course it's male dominated, yeah, the table, but it's still um, men tend to be less conflictious and more <laughs> cooperative and more diplomatic, you know, when um, women are present at the table, you know, so that is very interesting and we have actually to build on, on that and uh, uh, yeah, like, you know, have more women, but then the issue comes is that there is <laughs> not that enough women, you know, at the table, uh, so yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, at that we have to uh, unfortunately close this lively discussion, but I thank you all for attending and um, good luck at the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Take note of the first day. Don't just don't just. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>